Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Cherokee. I'm an associate professor of film and media studies in the English department here at Wayne State University. I'm also the faculty advisor for Kino Club 313, one of the student groups that organizes our annual Wayne Pop Conference. And I'm very happy that all of you could be with us here today. Uh, I wanted to state up front that we are recording this talk. You probably heard the little voice say that. Um, so if for any reason you lose your connection or you have to leave, there will be a copy of the talk going up on our conference website at a later date. Um, we're going to be leaving the audience on mute uh, during the talk itself. Uh, so if you have questions for the Q&A, um, please post them to the chat and our moderators will send them to me to ask. Um, and finally, if you're going to be tweeting this event, we would at, we ask that you uh, try to use our hashtag, which is WaynePop2020, which I've just put in the group chat for everyone. So this year, we combined the Wayne Pop Conference's keynote speech with the Dennis Turner Memorial Lecture. The annual Dennis Turner Lecture was made possible by a generous donation from the Turner family in memory of Dennis Turner, who was an assistant professor of film in the English department from 1981 until his untimely death three years later. Dennis had a wide knowledge of film with special interests in French and German cinema. He was the author of seven articles on film and he was working on a book on new German cinema at the time of his death. So to honor the memory of this extraordinary scholar and teacher, the English department hosts the Turner Lecture, which is given by a prominent media scholar or practitioner. And we're especially delighted this year that we have Dr. Shelley Streeby as our Turner speaker. Um, Shelley Streeby is a professor of ethnic studies at, and literature at the University of California, San Diego. Since 2010, she has worked as the director of the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop. Her book, Imagining the Future of Climate Change, World Making Through Science Fiction and Activism, which focuses on social movements led by indigenous people and people of color, was published by the University of California Press in 2018. She's also the author of Radical Sensations, World Movements, Violence and Visual Culture, which was published in 2013, and American Sensations, Class, Empire, and the Production of Popular Culture, which was published in 2002 and for which she received the American Studies Association's Laura Romero Prize. She's currently working on a new book called Speculative Archives, Hidden Histories and Ecologies of Science Fiction World Making, which builds off of her archival research into the Octavia E. Butler papers, which are housed at the Huntington Library in California and which explores the future-facing memory work done by female science fiction writers in their research. Uh, that book provides us with the title of today's Turner Lecture, Speculative Archives, Hidden Histories, and Ecologies of Science Fiction World Making. Um, everyone, I'm very happy to introduce Shelley Streeby. Thanks, Chera, for that kind introduction. Um, I want to begin by thanking all of the conference organizers, uh, Chera and Shelby uh, Cadwell and Matt Linton, uh, I was honored and excited to be invited. I wish we could all be there in person. And at the same time, though, I'm grateful that smart people like these three are figuring out ways to keep these conversations going, even at the worst of times. And it often feels to me these days like it's the worst of times, even though I know there have been many bad times and probably worse times. So I'm currently working on a new book, uh, as Tara mentioned, on women writers of speculative fiction who left behind large collections of archival materials and for whom memory work and popular culture uh, were crucial to imagining a future of what we might now call critical environmental justice. So I'm especially glad to see this program and the creative ways you're going about um, creating community. So both the last two books that Tara mentioned, my 2018 book, Imagining the Future of Climate Change, and the one I'm currently completing, Speculative Archives, center conversations among uh, popular culture, world making, speculative fiction and theory, and archival memory work. So one of my models that you see on the slide there for thinking about these connected convergences is the anthology Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction Stories from Social Justice Movements. This was co-edited by Walida Imarisha and Adrian Marie Brown, and I'll be talking about Brown uh, in the last part of the talk. So this book gained a wide following both inside and outside universities for its conjoining of science fiction and world making, 
in writing by participants in movement for social change. Octavia's Brood was inspired by and dedicated to the late great science fiction writer Octavia E. Butler out of the editor's quote, fierce longing to have our writing change everyone and everything we touch. In her introduction, Imarisha calls all organizing science fiction, arguing that organizers and activists dedicate their lives to creating and envisioning another world or many other worlds, and in doing so are engaging in speculative fiction. She further offers the term visionary fiction to distinguish, quote, science fiction that has relevance toward building newer, freer worlds from the mainstream strain of science fiction, which most often reinforces dominant narratives of power, end quote. All of the Octavio's rude writers were inspired by the idea of continuing, quote, Butler's legacy of writing visionary fiction, which Imaricha suggests provides space that is vital for any effort at decolonization, because the decolonization of the imagination is the most dangerous and subversive form there is, end quote. I build on Imarisha's and Brown's work to insist that our answers about transforming racial ecologies and climate change must not come solely from the sphere of science and technology, or they will be too narrow, not capacious enough. The work of the imagination is crucial, and popular culture is an important contributor to that conversation, not just a handmaiden to the gods of science and technology or a mere reflection of a deeper reality. The speculative stories, novels, films, and archives that I center in my work are visionary fictions created by writers, artists, and activists who struggle to conceive of words that worlds that diverge from dominant narratives of power and privilege. They decolonize the imagination by using speculative fiction and creating speculative archives to break with mainstream stories that privilege white settlers and fail to imagine deep change. One thing that surprised me after I wrote the first draft of Imagining the Future of Climate Change was that two key words kept popping up in each section, symbiosis and direct action. The Greek roots of the word symbiosis refer to living together, companionship, and partnering. In biology, at least since 1882, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it has signified the association of two different organisms, usually two plants or an animal and a plant, which live attached to each other, or one as a tenant of the other, and contribute to each other's support. Also, more widely, any intimate association of two or more different organisms, whether mutually beneficial or not. The authors of the document, Let Our Indigenous Voices Be Heard, which is a key text in part one of Imagining the Future of Climate Change, call for a productive symbiosis based upon mutual respect between indigenous and Western knowledges and sciences to serve shared goals of sustainability in the face of climate change. Octavia E. Butler, a major figure in both of these books, imagines symbiotic entanglements among humans, critters, and the earth that belie myths of isolated competitive individuals. Adrian Marie Brown, uh, the focus of the final part of this talk, partners with communities and movements using direct action to confront climate change and environmental racism and co-create, quote, symbiotic relationships based on our needs and our dreams. Today, with the limited time we have together, I'll focus on climate change and the archive Butler created over the course of her lifetime from 1947 to 2006 housed at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, as well as the living archive of visionary fiction and world making Brown and her collaborators are creating. To do so, I need to define one more key word, world making. While world making may refer to creating an imaginary universe in fiction, writing, or art more generally, I use it to emphasize how a large body of speculative feminist work for which Butler is an inspiration, moves off the page and out of the archive and into the world, making new communities both virtually and in the real world. The queer associations of the term world making, as Alexis Lafayan suggests in her recent book, Old Futures, Speculative Fiction and Queer Possibility, make it useful for thinking about the transformative project of queer theory and futurity and potentiality as they are sensed in pleasurable moments, as in the work of Jose Esteban Munoz. I also use it to think about the speculative as writing and art making that pushes beyond and blurs traditional genres and forms. Butler's fiction and collecting exemplify this, as does the work of many of the other writers, artists, and activists I discuss. All of these creators actively engage Butler's memory and experiment with speculative forms in ways that resonate with earlier women of color feminisms, refusing boundaries among fiction, poetry, nonfiction, feminist theory, and practice. 
These speculative futurist feminists both practice and theorize collaboration, interdisciplinarity, and intersectionality, creating spaces inside and outside the academy as part of a larger collective world-making project, creating a living archive that makes the speculative more than a cultural mode or an umbrella genre. Part one, archiving, constellating, and annotating climate change, the Octavia E. Butler papers. Although geographically proximate, the Huntington Library is a world away from the black working class neighborhood in Pasadena, California, where Octavia Butler grew up, the only child of her mother who cleaned houses and a father who died when Butler was only seven years old. From early school days, Butler saved almost everything relevant to her life as a student, researcher, and writer, along with many other kinds of material. Now rearranged in ways that respect Butler's own organizational schemas whenever possible, the more than 350 boxes that make up Butler's papers impress with their sheer extent. The finding aid authored by curator Natalie Russell is over 500 pages long. Butler's prodigious archiving activity makes it clear that this work was a central focus of her life, along with the writing the fiction, including her great climate change novel, Parable of the Sower, 1993, for which she is now famous. Given Butler's passion for archiving, it is perhaps not surprising that archiving and archivists frequently show up in drafts and fragments of her writing and in the extensive research she did on a wide array of topics, including climate change. Butler believed that archiving was an important profession that would be indispensable to the future. When drafting the never completed novel Parable of the Trickster in the early 2000s, for instance, she considered making the central protagonist, Imara, quote, an archivist, a kind of historian slash librarian slash journalist. In one fragment, she imagines Imara as what she calls a shaper archivist, shaping change through her ability, quote, to pull people together and get them to see why they must work together on a problem for the good of the group, end quote. In color-coded notes she created as writing aids, she even included the librarian archivist, which you can see there under work uh, in red, about four uh, columns down. And that person would be responsible for printing books, keeping records, and helping to teach as one of the key workers, along with farmers, builders, engineers, physicians, and explorers slash scavengers, who would crucially shape the post-apocalyptic world she speculated might emerge in the wake of climate change disaster. Butler's archive helps us see her significant contributions as a radical black feminist, theorist, historiographer, and researcher across fields and disciplines. Through her archiving, Butler imagines and performs a kind of reproduction with a difference. She preserves pieces of the past and present, but changes them as she constellates and annotates them with a speculative eye toward the future. Building on Walter Benjamin's insight in the origins of German tragic drama, that ideas are to objects as constellations are to stars, it is illuminating to situate Butler's constellating, her selection and organization of items for the archive, and her theorizing of connections among them in relation to other interventions into materialist critical historiography, such as those of W.E.B. Du Bois, Hubert Harrison, and other Black radical theorists of history, as well as the work of Benjamin himself. Indeed, Butler's papers are akin to Benjamin's arcade projects and their scope and significance as experiments in materialist historiography. In what follows, I use the verbs archiving, constellating, and annotating in order to emphasize that Butler was an active agent in creating counter histories and alternate futures by saving, organizing, connecting, and speculating on these disparate materials. In analyzing the significance of Butler's extensive annotations found throughout her papers, I am also inspired by literary critic Christina Sharp's theorizing of, quote, practices of Black annotation as wake work, which requires, quote, new modes of writing, new ways of making sensible in order to imagine otherwise. As well, we might consider Butler's archiving a form of speculative documentary, as Alexis Pauline Gums names the form of her own recent book, M Archive which he explains involved assembling, quote, an imagined archive that troubles the systems of knowledge she is involved in. This last connection also suggests how important feminism was to Butler's visionary materialist critical historiography and how Butler's life and work continue to inspire and shape women of color feminisms today, partly by modeling counter histories, intervening in knowledge production, experimenting with writing and refusing linear progress narratives in ways characteristic of women of color feminism since at least the 1980s. The Huntington Library must have loomed large as an elite local institution when Butler was a young woman, yet tucked away in a rich neighborhood and difficult to access 
by her by bus lines, which would have been an obstacle to Butler as a lifelong driver, expensive to visit, and with research collections that are impossible to access without two letters of recommendation and a formal application. It's unlikely Butler spent much time there before agreeing to donate her papers. This happened after recently retired archivist Sue Hodson saw Butler give a talk and became convinced Butler was one of the great ones whose papers the Huntington would be lucky to acquire. Hodson invited Butler to speak at the Huntington, and on one visit, when Hodson was driving her around, Butler told Hodson she was leaving her papers to the library. Even after Butler was invited to the Huntington to give talks, however, she still felt nervous speaking there, wondering in her journal in 2000, quote, what to say at Huntington, wishing she were doing something, quote, fancier, more Huntington, and Riley reflecting that, quote, it's terrible enough that I will arrive wearing polyester, end quote. At the same time, the fact that the Huntington wanted her papers was a significant mark of the high position she had achieved as a writer, which was definitely important to Butler. Given Butler's often stated distress over the political failure to materially support public education and public libraries she was witnessing in the 1990s and early 2000s, a topic I address in a recent Women's Studies article, it's entirely possible that Butler may have feared public libraries would soon no longer exist in the short-sighted, tax-cutting, rich people aggrandizing, neoconservative dystopia she saw on the horizon, and that she imagined the Huntington would outlast them. Butler often deplored the poor condition of many of the public library's materials to the point that she repaired them herself. In this context, it is noteworthy that a 1991 Los Angeles Times article on research at the Huntington Library that Butler saved emphasizes that, quote, because of the fragility of the manuscripts, as well as the difficulty in using them, only the most experienced scholars are given access to the inner library of the Huntington, end quote. The article also claimed that, quote, scholars in the humanities are among the lowest paid in a profession that is known for its generous remuneration, and that many scholars funded their research, quote, from their own limited salaries, which were rarely enough to, quote, cover the high cost of living in Southern California. This article was written just as the Huntington was starting to offer fellowships to researchers, which have expanded over the years, but today access is still very restricted, and the social and economic boundaries of using the Huntington's collections are palpable. All of the busts of eminent figures in the Huntington Library reading room are of white men, and there are still too many days when only white people are doing research there. In this context, making Butler's papers more accessible is of utmost importance. I've been lucky to be a small part of the collective project to uh, move some of the knowledge Butler produced out of the archive and into the world. The most important person in this endeavor is Ayanna Jamison, the founder of the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network, the digital hub that she and Moya Bailey created to bring together artists, artists, uh, activists, artists, writers, scholars, and fans. Another significant creator of Butler-focused arts and humanities programming is Julia Meltzer, whose arts collective Clock Shop produced a year-long series in Los Angeles called Radio Imagination, Artists and Writers in the Archive of Octavia E. Butler, which included 10 commissioned works of speculative writing and art that have been recently memorialized in a limited edition book. In June 2016, I co-organized with Ayanna Jamison a conference at UCSD on Butler's papers, writings, and legacies called Shaping Change, where artists, activists, writers, students, and community members came together to talk about the significance of Butler's body of work for activism, art, and world making. The interdisciplinary conference uh, on Butler's papers, co-organized by Jamison and Moya Bailey, Moya Bailey has the red pants there, in June 2017, which coincided with a Huntington exhibit on Butler, was a major event in the history of Octavia E. Butler studies. And there in the top row, uh, you can see um, three people in uh, is the uh, archivist, who, Natalie Russell, who uh, wrote the 500-page finding aid. And right next to her, though a shorter woman with gray hair, that's Sue Hodson, the one who acquired the papers. Then you see a bunch of other amazing people uh, in that frame uh, who are doing great work on Butler. Down at the bottom uh, left is also Octavia's cousin, who was there for this uh, wonderful occasion and had really interesting um, things to share. So all of these different projects aim to extend access to the archive, to interact with it in order to argue for Butler's significance as a major intellectual, and to help inspire new art, speculative writing, and collective activity. The collection of Butler's papers is so large, it's difficult to adequately describe it. 
It encompasses drafts, notes, outlines, and fragments from every piece of fiction and nonfiction Butler ever published or didn't publish, as well as school papers, poetry, screenplays, diaries, journals, and many other kinds of writing. There are dozens of note cards Butler created for different purposes, including making speeches, which was very difficult for her as a painfully shy person. She also used the note cards to compile bibliographies, take research notes, and construct a thesaurus of names. The papers include scores of wire-bound notebooks in which Butler records her everyday life, brainstorms, and writes drafts uh, of pages of her novels and stories. More than 40 boxes contain thousands of letters Butler received and copies of letters she sent to others, as well as hundreds of photographs, including many she took on research trips to places such as Peru and Alaska. Here, for instance, is a photograph Butler took of lichens and air pollution, uh, a poster during a 2000 trip to Alaska. Butler also kept extensive research files covering a range of topics with annotated clippings from the Los Angeles Times and especially prominent source. She organized many of these clippings into clusters that she placed within manila envelopes under various headings, writing the dates and the titles of the articles on the front of the envelope for easy reference. Finally, Butler's papers encompass more than 50 boxes of ephemera, including awards, contracts, royalty statements, date books, greeting cards, periodicals, printed materials by and about herself, documents connected to travel, including local bus trips, her many speaking engagements, and much, much more. In Butler's notebooks of the 1980s, she named her speculative writing, theorizing, and archiving practices histo-futurism which she defined as both an alternative to and a merging of the work of historians and futurists. In the paragraph where she coins the term, Butler briefly alludes to the Futurians, quote, a specific old time fan group, and quote, future history, a subgenre of science fiction, as she considers the words different variants and meanings. She also criticizes, quote, futurists who study the recent past and present in an effort to forecast the future for making people into, quote, puppets or leaving them out entirely to vindicate particular systems and champion new technologies as the main drivers of history. Claiming the histo-futurist as her own invention, Butler imagines this figure as one who extrapolates from the human and technological past and present by researching, archiving, and then working over research materials to speculate about possible futures that might materialize on their foundations. When Butler invented the figure of the histofuturist as an aspirational ideal in late 1981, she was still considering pursuing formal education, specifically to gain expertise in history, though she soon ambivalently, ambivalently abandoned that idea in favor of spending more time immersing herself in writing and self-directed research. On November 24, 1981, she wrote in a notebook that she wanted a, quote, bachelor's degree, a master's, and a PhD in history, and that achieving those degrees would mean she, quote, had become an historian, truly educated, first made aware through facts new to me of new possibilities for study, for thought, and most important, through writing fact or fiction. Even then, Butler recognized that her interest did not lie at the center of the discipline of history as it was currently institutionalized, but rather were closer to, quote, cultural history and applied anthropology, end quote. In her notes on the histofuturist, Butler distinguished what she hoped to do through her archive making and speculative fiction writing from the work of the historian as she understood it. Complaining that too many historians have, quote, axes to grind, she charged that, quote, groups are ignored, their contributions co-opted, their deficiencies magnified and added to, their humanity denied, the crimes against them ignored. In the U.S., she suggested, quote, women, Indians, Blacks have had longstanding harm done to them. End quote. In 1989, when she briefly considered making the protagonist of Parable of the Sower and Historian, she further reflected in one of her many notebooks that her own interests had been, quote, in the history of science and non-Western history, as well as, quote, Africa, the Near and Far East, and, quote, the Middle East. Butler's histofuturist speculative archiving is a kind of knowledge production, an apparatus for producing counter-historical narratives and forms of radical speculation that provide alternatives to dominant histories and ways of knowing. I find especially useful Parable of the Sower, the cautionary tale Butler wrote in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Butler once said that, quote, global warming is a character in Parable of the Sower. And while writing the sequel, Parable of the Talents, she often reminded herself in research notes to show the greenhouse world, 
Butler's research on the greenhouse effect and global warming and on the disasters of these eras and emerging environmental movements highlights emerging scientific research on climate change in the 80s and 90s and how politicians, the fossil fuel industry and activists responded to that research. This working class black woman genius's memory work is helpfully illuminating of that history, even as it models an interdisciplinary engagement with the sciences through Butler's study and research. In 1991, as Butler was finishing Parable of the Sower, she worried over the depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer, the enormous underground freshwater source upon which much of the middle United States depends. In California, she theorized, lawns exist because, quote, non-Hispanic whites from the East, from wetter climates, quote, recalled them and, quote, wanted the living green fragrant mats as bits of the homes they'd left, end quote. Critical of human efforts to remake places they settled in destructive ways, Butler charged it was stupid, wasteful, and utterly without foresight. This last and especially significant insult coming from her to hubristically transform the desert into lawns, golf courses, and quote, power eating cities of light and night, such as Las Vegas, Laughlin, and Phoenix. They spend their tomorrows today as a critique Butler leveled repeatedly at politicians who sacrifice the future for short term gains and economic growth in the present prioritizing immediate profits over water, the climate, and the earth. Butler's lament that, quote, all we do is destructive, presupposes the value of mutualism over the kinds of parasitism encouraged by political and economic neoconservatism, which imagines a world made up of isolated individuals competing with each other to turn resources into property and extract profit in ways that supposedly are best for everyone. As Donna Haraway suggests, Many biologists have also used possessive individualism as a template for understanding nature. Indeed, Butler's interest in, quote, symbiogenetic imaginations and materialities make her a theorist of what Haraway calls a new, new synthesis in transdisciplinary biology and arts that moves away from modern sciences rooting in units and relations, especially competitive relations, to explore, quote, symbiosis and collaborative entanglements the vast worldings of microbes and exuberant critter biobehavioral inter and intra reactions. Butler often used the language of symbiosis to think about human and non-human animals futures on the planet. In 1990, while writing Parable, Butler acknowledged humans, quote, are symbionts upon the earth, but that, quote, not all symbionts are alike. Although humans were presently, quote, parasites destroying our environment, she hoped we could become, quote, mutualists symbionts who truly partner the earth, benefiting it as it benefits us, or at worst, doing no harm to it. Butler believed, quote, parasitism upon our environment was not same behavior, but rather greed, short-sightedness, denial, self-indulgence, indifference, death, end quote. She understood this deathly parasitism and short-sighted, greedy indifference to be a defining feature of the political world around her. Butler's archive reveals blind spots and discourses about the environment and climate change by centering race and gender and emphasizing the difficult but necessary work of building collectivities in the wake of climate change slow disaster. Butler was ahead of her time in worrying about what she prophetically named slow disasters, including global warming, which she insisted was, quote, not just an incident like a fire, a flood, or an earthquake, but rather, quote, an ongoing trend, boring, lastly, lasting, deadly, Critically commenting on 1980s politicians who she feared were destroying the planet due to avaricious obtuseness, she warned, quote, if you notice a slow disaster, you have to pay a lot of money, put forward a lot of effort, and wound entrenched interests who will stop you if they can, end quote. Butler's theorization of slow disaster anticipates by two decades Rob Nixon's award-winning book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, in which he conceptualized climate change as a kind of slow violence that is, quote, typically not viewed as violence at all because it, quote, occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, end quote. Butler's 1980s and 1990s memory work around climate change in the public sphere resonates with the work of the emerging climate justice movement, even as her body of writing and archiving activity raised difficult questions about colonization, community, and coalition building in imagining the future of climate change through visionary fiction. At a time when many despair that climate change science is too difficult for people without advanced science degrees to understand, Butler's critical archiving activity, as well as her imaginings of forms of symbiosis beyond possessive individualism, are especially illuminating.
While most of the essential research proving that climate change was spurred by human activity had been completed by the 1960s, only when the mean global temperature began to rise in the late 1980s did climate change emerge as the subject of widespread concern in the scientific community and for social movements. Butler saved materials as early as 1965, including many from late 1970s news coverage about changes in the weather. But there is a significant uptick in 1981 and 1982 when Reagan was elected and began to make dramatic changes in US environmental policies. Butler also compiled large clusters of material about climate and the greenhouse effect in the late 1980s and 1990s, the year she was writing the parable novels. Although earlier the state had responded to the emerging environmental movement by establishing new regulations, laws, and institutions, by the end of the 1980s, the Reagan administration rolled back and otherwise undermined many of them. Working on the right-wing premise that governments should get out of the way of businesses and corporations, and that citizens needed to be liberated from the nanny state to realize their potential as individual entrepreneurs, Reagan and his team were hostile to an environmental movement that warned of the cost to the planet and its people of unfettered capitalism, and which sought not only to regulate and control, but also to imagine a collective good and create the solidarities and alliances necessary to realize it. Butler's disaster files include material from 1965 to 2000, including stories about tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, droughts, and fires, along with manifestly human-made disasters, such as the 1995 Oklahoma City bombings and the 1992 Rodney King verdict. The environment envelopes, on the other hand, include dozens of newspaper and magazine articles published between 1965 and 2004 that overwhelmingly stress human agency in bringing about the catastrophic climate changes on the horizon. Butler saved a 1988 article about ozone depletion that emphasized its protection must be an international responsibility, as well as early 1990s stories about the coming extinction of millions of animals and the necessity of, quote, taking prompt action to curb global warming. Late 1990s articles track melting Antarctic glaciers that, quote, could flood coastal areas, scientists say, or link to global warming storms such as those so common in her disaster files. Explaining the purpose of this research in an interview in 1993, Butler called herself, quote, a news junkie who can't help wondering what the environmental and economic stupidities of the 80s and 90s might lead to, end quote. During the 1980s, many of Butler's climate change related uh, clippings concern the greenhouse effect, but there are also several on the political dimensions of the climate crisis. The connections Butler made between the Reagan administration's policies and imminent danger to the environment are preserved, for instance, in an LA Times editorial entitled, Nation's Leaders Must Remember Times to Come. Butler wrote environment at the top of this article, along with the comment that instead they will sell our birthright for a quick profit. The story worried that Secretary of the Interior James Watt would make more Western lands available for oil drilling and strip mining, and asked, quote, how long can we in our arrogance force the environment to meet our desires instead of fitting our desires to the environment? In the margins, Butler wrote good common sense after this question and added several comments in red uh, a few months later, including her fear that Watt's fuck tomorrow attitude will destroy us. She also wrote angry red annotations on other articles about Reagan undermining the Air Quality Control Act and seeking to reduce requirements on industry. While attacks on environmental regulations intensified during the 1980s, new scientific research on ice samples and deep ocean histories impacted conversations about greenhouse gases and climate change. Butler carefully documented the science news while questioning the Reagan administration's ecological obtuseness and idealization of short-term profit. In 1989, Butler annotated another article about how global warming would create superstorms like Hurricane Hugo, which that year caused 50 deaths, left 100,000 people homeless, and was the most expensive storm up to that point to hit the US. Butler carefully underlined in green sentences that explained how a warmer ocean causes more evaporation and that warmer air can hold more water vapor, both of which increase the power of hurricanes. As well, Butler kept stories about how global warming was affecting the ocean, causing whole populations of sea creatures to migrate northward, along with a 1992 article predicting that as many as half of the planet's species could vanish or dwindle to nothing in the near future, with large animals still existing only in scattered preserves or zoos, their survival dependent on frozen embryos, sperm, and eggs. <clears throat> 
The dry, harsh, austere world, too poor for lights, cell phones, and public schools, and where water is a luxury to which the poor have only intermittent access, looms ominously at the beginning of Parable of the Sower, which provides a visceral imagining of life on a poorer, simpler planet, the greenhouse world created by human-produced global warming. This is the world Butler's protagonist Lauren inhabits at the outset of her novel, quote, an unprivileged enclave, as Butler called it in a 1988 notebook entry. In the opening, Lauren dwells inside the ill-fated gated community with her parents and brothers before a fire is the phoenix that burns out the old world of way of life. As Lauren moves north up abandoned highways, dressed as a man, she collects people to form a community of disposable, beaten down, vulnerable folks of many different races and national origins. In 1990, Butler described the novel as the coming of age story of a woman's struggle to help the free poor of her time to unite, help one another and partner the earth, restoring it, not subduing it, end quote. In earlier drafts, Butler was much more explicit about global warming, naming it as the precipitating cause of this harsh, austere, near future world. Quote, the country, the world was in rapid indisputable transition, she wrote in an early fragment, because quote, climate change was global, indisputable and ongoing. Southern California is hit especially hard, its problems with water growing dramatically worse. Politicians finally begin to make laws restricting the burning of fossil fuels, but it's too late. Although, quote, obvious water and power hogs such as Phoenix and Las Vegas suffer first, residents of Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego no longer have air conditioning, and global warming explains, as Butler puts it, why they are having so much difficulty with waters. The heavily guarded water stations and itinerant water merchants who sell this increasingly precious and rare commodity to the roving poor were inspired by Butler's rigorous extrapolation from ominous trends in her present. Butler predicted that the 2020s would be the decade of collapse in which humans would witness sea level rise, dryness, heat, crop failures, institutions no longer working or existing only to collect taxes and fees and to arrest people to exploit their labor. Quote, this is the story of the burn, she wrote, a period in history when old ways of life were dying as the climate changed, food and water became scarce, expensive, unsafe, and the focus of much criminal activity, and new ways were being born. By the 2020s, everything has to change, and the old ways have to die, even as people, quote, wall themselves in and suffer privatization. Even worse, quote, the seas are rising, and the air is hot and dusty and brown. In the 2030s, ecological changes caused truly hard times, with only a few rich people doing well. Quote, walled in, flying, boating, and tanking in supplies, they take on poor people as indentured servants in return for room and board. By 2040, companies have been given broader rights to continue the slow environmental degradation of rising seas, searing deserts, cancer, unbearable heat, and more, while religious authorities promise, if we right ourselves, we can return to the old days, quote, when God liked us best. In other words, Butler imagined racial capitalism and globalization from above as a kind of scorched earth, slow disaster worsening over time, one to which her imaginings of different worlds and communities and other more sustainable ways of life responded. Instead of, quote, storing up disaster for immediate wealth, as right-wing leaders around the world did, Butler advised, we might instead start preparing people for the climate changes to come, partly by changing the ways we educate. By imagining a community that makes, quote, new ways in the, quote, ashes of the old, and by critically documenting the intersecting histories of climate change science and neoliberal politics from the 1960s through the early 2000s, Butler's visionary fiction and histo-futurist archiving offer a deeper understanding of the inequalities, divisions, and solidarities created by climate change. In all of these ways, Butler's archiving activity and the world-making collective projects we're currently witnessing in response to it create new historical meanings to help us think outside of discourses of progress and development. The juxtaposed fragments of Butler's past and present produce constellations from many luminous points, comprising star signs that bring time into a critical state and thereby illuminate pathways to imagining otherwise. Part two, symbiosis, direct action, and climate change, world making with Adrienne Marie Brown. In her indispensable book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, activist and speculative fiction writer, Adrian Marie Brown, advises in confronting climate change today, quote, we need to have a level of dystopian consideration. Quote, certain climate realities are no longer wild imaginings. They are happening and they are coming. Game of Thrones watchers, winter is here and it's balmy, end quote. Referencing the HBO show based on George R. R. Martin's fantasy novels to make the point that climate change is already happening, Brown explains that in this context, quote, Octavia Butler appeals to me because she wanted to prepare us for the changes that are now inevitable. Quote, 
Change is coming. What do we need to imagine as we prepare for it? Brown's ideas about shaping change in social movements were especially inspired by Parable of the Sower. Indeed, Brown calls it one of the cornerstones of my awareness of emergent strategy, which is partly based on the leadership model found in Butler's work. In Octavia's Brood, Brown suggests that the key elements of emergent strategy are, quote, that it is intentional, interdependent, and relational, adaptive, resilient, because it is decentralized, fractal, uses transformative justice, and creates more possibilities, end quote. One of the ways she and her collaborators use Butler's work is, quote, as case studies of emergent strategy. In sessions with local communities, we're introducing people to the framework and asking them to assess which elements of emergent strategy might be most necessary to their local work and supporting them in generating strategies together, end quote. This, quote, collective ideation continues in science fiction, visionary fiction writing workshops where they, quote, get more of us involved in building shared worlds that address, quote, what in our community needs vision. In these ways, Butler's legacies of intersectional feminism move outside of her books and archive and into the world of social movements and community organization life and activity. Brown's emergent strategy is a prime example of the multi-form boundary crossing speculative writing inspired by Butler. It is thought provoking, hilarious, moving and poetic all at once. It makes important contributions to intersectional feminist theory by connecting feminism to other social movements. Brown calls it, quote, a collection of essays, speeches, spells, interviews, conversations, tools, profiles, and poems during my learning processes in the face of the wonder of the world. It's also a guidebook for people and organizations and movements, providing concrete advice about how best to collectively shape change within such contexts. She has a chapter called Notes for Haters, I think, which I especially like, which is addressed to the person who is a hater about everything and like is always coming up with the negative thing and really charging that person with, uh, you know, taking a more active role and kind of planning other possibilities. So addressing the book to people, quote, who want to radically change the world, she encourages readers to approach the book non-linearly and to read it collectively in relation to activist organizing and struggle. Not surprisingly, it is featured prominently on Amazon's list for books on radicalism, rising to number three, and feminist theory, where it reached number 15. Emergent strategy, as Brown suggests, was, quote, initially a way of describing the adaptive and relational leadership model found in the work of Black science fiction writer Octavia Butler. Decentralized, with no single person holding all the power, and fractal, practicing at a small scale what we most want to see at the universal level. Instead of insisting on the one true path, Quote, Octavia's leaders were creating more and more possibilities, producing, quote, an abundance of features, of ways to manage resources together, to be brilliant together, end quote. Throughout, Brown builds on the work of earlier Black feminists, such as Tony Cade Bambara, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and Lucille Clifton, as well as her mentor, Grace Lee Boggs, I'm sure someone, those of you in Detroit, know and remember quite well, to whose memory she dedicates emergent strategy. Brown is also interested in complex sciences, biomimicry, permaculture, and the quote, small collective creatures who are humble and abundant and resilient, which he credits Grace Lee Boggs with putting on her radar. Quote, I dream of a movement with such deep trust that we move as a murmuration, she writes in Emergent Strategy. The way groups of starlings billow, dive, spin, dance collectively through the air to avoid predators, and it also seems to pass time in the most beautiful way possible, end quote. The shift to an adaptive and relational style of leadership is one Brown herself helped to bring about as executive director of the RECA Society from 2006 to 2011, guiding the transformation from, quote, patriarchal to feminist leadership, although she didn't think of it that way at the time. The organization became a, quote, team of women, majority, queer, at the staff level, who are not just women leaders, but leaders who shift our understanding of how power can be held, end quote. She explicitly connects these principles to contemporary movements such as Black Lives Matter and to queer world making, as in her statement that, quote, when a Black, queer, thick artist woman intentionally takes up space, it creates a new world, end quote. Butler helps with queer world making because her protagonists, quote, are interdependent, often polyamorous, as well as adaptable and interdependent through, quote, the practice of repeated vulnerability, end quote. Among the, quote, key practices that show up in Octavia Butler's work, Brown points out, are collaboration, compassion, curiosity, romantic and sensual and non-possessive love, play, mediation, and the patience that comes from seeing ourselves in a much longer arc of time than we are encouraged to see in the instantaneous culture of the modern world, end quote. Brown has organized many, many events, quote, to encourage people to read and examine Octavia Butler's work from a strategic perspective, which has led to books, zines, collectives, and other tangible forms of loving Octavia, end quote. 
In 2010, at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit, Brown facilitated a particularly generative session on Butler that became the basis of a, quote, crowdsourced document, according to Moya Bailey, that included the questions and musings of nearly 100 Octavia enthusiasts. With Alexis Pauline Gumbs, Brown co-edited the resulting Octavia Butler Strategic Reader, which was made available online for free to anyone interested in working with the text. In a forthcoming review piece in Feminist Studies, I elaborate on how this new body of speculative feminist work, for which Butler is an inspiration, moves off the page and out of the archive and into the world. I first became aware of Brown in 2018 when Amy Goodman interviewed her on Democracy Now! about the US Social Forum in Detroit, attended by over 10,000 people from more than 100 grassroots organizations. Brown was national co-coordinator of the program, organizing coalitions by using digital and media technologies, as well as speculative fiction and Butler's novels. She was also director of allied media projects in Detroit. The US Social Forums had begun in 2007 in Atlanta, inspired by the world social forums that emerged as a kind of grassroots globalization movement a little earlier. Brown found inspiration in how world forums outside the US used culture broadly conceived, including film festivals, performances, and people's assemblies to imagine different futures of climate change and social justice. Calling ecological and climate justice central to the forum's work, Brown told Goodman she planned to create a people's movement assembly for organizers who have been working on the relationship between people and planet to come together and say, what are the major priority issues? She led a protest on the forum's closing day in which thousands of activists marched and rallied at the Detroit incinerator, the largest in the world, demanding its closure. Brown was especially excited by how ideas about creating change moved through the workshops and into the people's movement assemblies, then into action and into the streets. At the same time, Brown was also co-creating materialist black feminist futurisms through media justice work and by using Butler's speculative fiction as a springboard for organizing communities. In the interview, she talks about her involvement with Allied Media Conference, a gathering of, quote, visionary media makers, operating on the premise that, quote, everyone can be a media maker, teaching, quote, folks to make their own radios, make their own computers, and really be the people that tell the story and create the history of their own communities, end quote. At the conference, Brown explained, she facilitated an Octavia Butler symposium where participants talked about post-apocalyptic survival and how Butler's ideas were, quote, relevant to us now as organizers who are in the throes of change that we don't have any capacity to comprehend. It's easy to be devastated, she observes, but I think Octavia Butler's work calls us to be inspired instead, end quote. Inspired by Butler, Brown has worked with many movements, doing environmental, food, reproductive, gender, economic, and other justice work, and collaborating with organizations that do harm reduction work with drug users and sex workers, voter organizing at the national level, food justice work in Detroit, and nonviolent direct action training, primarily supporting indigenous peoples and other communities directly impacted by climate crisis. To name just a few examples, Brown has collaborated with the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, working on healthy digital ecologies in which people learn to use the internet to transform their communities, uh, and the Black Water Coalition, what's happening here? Oh, there we are. And the Black uh, Mesa Water Coalition, a group of young intertribal and interethnic people dedicated to addressing issues of water depletion, natural resource ex exploitation, and health promotion within Navajo and Hopi communities. And Insight, a national activist organization of radical feminists of color working to end violence against women of color, trans and gender nonconforming people of color, and our communities through direct action, critical dialogue, and grassroots organizing. Brown builds on Butler's work to imagine the future of climate change in three especially illuminating ways. First, her approach is intersectional. She understands climate change cannot be isolated from other economic, social, scientific, and technological problems. In other words, confronting climate change necessarily involves confronting other inequalities. The insistence on not isolating climate change problems from larger economic, racial, and social problems and conflicts over colonialism is one of the biggest differences between mainstream environmental movements and movements that enjoy significant leadership from indigenous people and people of color. Second, though Brown is attuned to the particularities of place, she also thinks about climate change as a world problem and makes connections between particular places and the unequal ways climate change is affecting us. Her movements use a range of strategies, including appeals to law, nation states, and international bodies, as well as direct action to shape change in more basic ways not beholden to nation states or wealthy stakeholders. Finally, Brown works at intersections that centrally involve indigenous people and people of color and thinks about complex relations and solidarities of many sorts, including around climate justice. 
Teaching direct action <clears throat> is central to the creative and future shaping work Brown does with youth and other movements. In a 2009 interview in the Voices of Climate Change series, Brown explains she came to Detroit in 2006 to do organizational development and for direct action trainings with Detroit Summer, a project co-founded by Grace Lee Boggs and Michelle Brown. In 1992, Detroit Summer, a multiracial intergenerational collective, worked to transform communities through youth leadership, creativity, and collective direct action. Direct action was important for Brown when she was executive director of the Ruckus Society and sat on their board through 2012. The Ruckus Society, formed in Oregon in 1995, provides environmental, human rights, and social justice movement organizers with tools, training, and support through strategic use of creative, nonviolent direct action. Created in response to an anti-environment pro-logging bill signed by President Clinton that galvanized intense resistance, they train and support communities ranging from frontline climate change activists from the Arctic North to the Gulf Coast to Latina garment workers in LA, day laborers in the SF Bay Area, steel workers in Indiana, student organizers in New York City, hip hop artists from both coasts, conscientious objectors in the heartland, and indigenous organizers across North America, end quote. Brown explains why direct action is so important to the visionary futurism she co-creates with communities. Quote, direct action is where escalation happens, where people can play an active role in advancing a negotiation, where we see and feel each other's solidarity. She reminds us direct action was key to civil rights movements when we first saw images of blacks and whites at lunch counters together in the South. She argues that today, quote, guerrilla gardens, like those Butler imagined as part of a climate change future in Parable of the Sower, are, quote, a way to show that we know how to live more sustainably, and we will push our leaders to catch up with us, end quote. For Brown, direct action means living and co-creating the world you want to see. Quote, our actions have to be toward the world we want, she insists. We need to be guerrilla gardening and turning people's heat and water on. We need to be the guerrillas putting up solar panels in the hood. Rather than trying to, quote, fit into someone's assembly line and make things for the class above us, Brown understands direct action as indispensable to liberation, with the latter defined as freedom, quote, to work for our own communities, to thrive, to be in symbiotic relationships based on our needs and our dreams, end quote. As Brown's organizing suggests, connecting indigenous people's struggles over climate change and the environment to those of people of color in the United States is one of her major contributions. One of the biggest problems today, according to Brown, is how non-Indigenous people, quote, learn to disrespect Indigenous and direct ties to land. She states that her work with the Indigenous People's Power Project was transformative for her organizing and vision of the world. The collective's aim was to build a body of Indigenous organizers who became action experts within their own communities. In the process, she and Ruckus learned a lot about breaking down the walls between different issue areas. She claims that Ruckus's work with Indigenous groups made the small organization grow, quote, from a kick-ass majority white male-led environmental issue network to a kick-ass female-led multicultural justice and environmental-centered network, end quote. Since 2010, Brown has facilitated the connection of groups and issues around climate justice, social change, movement building, and speculative fiction in a number of ways. In an interview with Moya Bailey in a 2013 special issue on feminist science fiction in ADA, a journal of gender, new media, and technology, Brown talks about using Butler and speculative fiction to do this work, and of her, quote, growing suspicion that the realm of science fiction and speculative fiction could be a great place to intentionally practice the futures we long for, end quote. Connecting many of the most important struggles for climate justice across space and time through her intersectional movement building and speculative fiction, Brown helps communities, quote, flex their collective imagination muscle and envision, quote, creative direct actions. In the face of the failure of nation states and international bodies to set binding carbon emissions limits that might save the planet as we know it, these kinds of networked local strategies, direct actions, and collective envisionings of the future may well be our best hope in co-creating other worlds in the wake of the climate change disaster that is now upon us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for the invitation and for hanging in there. So uh, I'll remind everyone that uh, we're going to keep everyone on mute for the time being. But if you have questions, please uh, write them in the chat and we will ask them. But um, I actually wanted to get started uh, with a question. It, it's, I guess, kind of more of a meta question. Um, is I'm wondering a little bit about the archive of your own personal work and specifically this book. Um, and kind of what led you to this topic 
um, and in particular the, the the Octavia Butler papers in the first place. And and what are the kind of it, you know if we were you know 20, 30 years down the line to look at the archive of this book, what are the kind of different threads that we would be like looking at? Wow, that's a really great uh, question and a very complicated one. Um, I would say that throughout my entire career that uh, finding archives that illuminate um, counter histories from below has been a constant. That's actually what I was trying to do at the beginning of my very first book. I came to the Berkeley English Department as a graduate student kind of wanting to argue against the special American conditions uh, theory that uh, the U.S. was essentially a middle-class nation, that there was no class conflict in America. So I was going to be the one to do archival research to kind of show this working class culture that actually existed. And so I did like dig around and do all this work in working class newspapers. I started to do that as a graduate student. But then when I got to UC San Diego uh, and was surrounded by colleagues in the Spanish and cultural studies sections and the geopolitical situation really pushed me to dig even deeper. And then I found that almost every white working class advocate I had done research on had also written some imperial story, whether anti-imperialist or pro-imperialist about the US-Mexico war. So, you know, uh, that was my initial impetus for doing this kind of digging. But I would say that, you know, that kind of kept being my method in everything I did with radical sensations, you know, trying to kind of illuminate this forgotten history of transnational radicalism from the uh, 1880s through the 1920s that had kind of dropped out of view, partly because in order to bridge uh, differences of language and space, people were often using visual culture. And, you know, that would come, that I would drop out often when um, literary critics were trying to find histories of working class culture in that era. Of course, there's been all kinds of other wonderful work, not just mine pointing to that, those histories, but I think often they kind of fell from view. So, you know, that was probably the, the book in which I sort of did the most digging. But then I had always taught Butler in my very first class that I was able to design as a graduate course at UC Berkeley in expository writing, I taught Parable of the Sower. So it was the year that it came out. It was right after the 1992 LA uprisings. And that was the context in which I taught it. It always remained a constant and a touchstone in my teaching. I was never someone who wanted to stay in the box of periodization, even though it's oddly, people would often express the disappointment to me later. We're so sad that you're not in the antebellum period anymore. <laughs> I like to work in a lot of different periods, but um, Butler has always been there and has been important to me. So when I heard about that she had left the papers, I wanted to see what was there and to think about um, the histories that I'd long been teaching through that lens. And so I showed up in 2013 after there was an email blast telling us all uh, that the archive had finally been opened. And I would also say the other crucial thing that happened for me there was meeting Ayanna Jameson. So I've talked about Ayanna in the talk. She's an independent scholar, brilliant uh, writer and uh, researcher. And, you know, we started hanging out together a little bit. We were just really, I think the one of the sources of our connection was that we both really hated the idea that there were some scholars who were talking about like getting into the archive and being the first to get the things out and really touting themselves as like you know being the first and all that and we both really didn't like that we both thought that it had to be not about self-aggrandizement but about trying to you know build these larger communities and connect to other kinds of folks and from there, I just became very passionate about this because I'd never had the opportunity to be kind of involved in a larger collective effort like that and have people who thought about research the way I did. And so it really, those are the things that really got me going. But in the book, as you can probably tell, there are a lot of other archives. And so, you know, I've become a kind of archive I have archive fever, maybe, as Derrida would say, but I keep trying to sort of track these things down. And it just really struck me that you have these women, Le Guin, uh, you know, Tiptree slash Ellis Sheldon, and others who were amassing these large collections. Butler's is massive. Um, Le Guin's is also very large, but it's much more controlled, I would say. It's like Butler's trying to fit every single thing in that she can, and she doesn't have a lot of worry, it seems, about um, you know, whether it's going to make her look bad or whether it's embarrassing. There's a lot of actually very intimate things in the archive that Ayanna and I all often talk about. We feel a little 
protective of them and we're hoping that no scholar busts in there and does like some kind of insensitive work with any of that stuff. But anyway, um, you know, so Le Guin was doing this. Judith Merrill is someone who's kind of fallen off the map today, but I'm really interested in her. She was part of the Futurians group with um, Asimov and she left a huge amount of material uh, both to uh, the um, you know, library in Toronto and then moved some of it to uh, Ottawa because she was mad at the head of the Merrill collection back in the 80s or 90s for different reasons. But there's huge amounts of, of stuff from her about her leaving the United States, giving up her citizenship, doing a transnational research project with a bunch of Japanese science fiction writers and scholars where she was translating with other people tons of science fiction that uh, illuminated like um, controversies over radiation and imperialism. So anyway, I just keep finding that there's so many different answers to the questions I care about when I dig deeper in this way. And it's made me someone who, much as I love pulling a classic book off the shelf and doing a close reading, uh, I just feel like that is never enough, you know? And so I'm always wanting to uh, find other stories, find other answers. And I have to say Octavia's histofuturism is the most amazing example of that I've ever come across. Well, and I like that up front, there's this idea that I think every every archive is different to the person who walks in mm -hmm. and and i kind of I, I kind of like uh that you feel protective of it but that like i think you walk in knowing that you're viewing it in a in a very particular way and that someone else would come in very differently um let's see okay so i wonder if you would talk about how you see the relationship between the archives you've delved into and the geological archive of the mm -hmm. anthropocene how and where cultural and environmental archives intersect, either in your own work or in Butler's? Wow, I mean, that's such a smart question. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do justice to it. I'm, it's now just reverberating around my head and I feel like there's so many different angles to it. So I'm probably not gonna be adequate to it, but it is interesting to think about that analogy, I guess, um, you know, uh, the, the sort of analogy of, uh, it's an interesting one to speculate about. I'd really love to hear from the, the person who asked it if we were together, so maybe they could chime in, like whether they have any thoughts about that. Wait. I have, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, well, thanks for that. I'm, um, so I work in environmental media studies and I'm really interested in the question of the archive as, um, as both a space where where culture is accumulated, but then also the space where culture is becoming um, geology. Mm. Um, so the sort of afterlives of our material culture, including, I mean, especially in media culture with its rapid obsolescence, et cetera, but also the sort of environmental costs of maintaining archives, mm -hmm. um, archival spaces, temperature control, all of these things, the way that they sort of overlap. And I mean, they sort of have an amplification effect potentially or, um, they can, I mean, they, they contribute in very direct ways to climate change and global warming. And I was just thinking about all these papers, um, all of this wonderful um, material that you found um, that Octavia Butler had collected and wondered if she was thinking at all about archives and that kind of um, a physical way that impacts also the earth um, that leaves its own um, geological trace as well as its cultural trace. I don't see any signs that she was actively thinking about them in that way, but I hesitate to say that because I'm sure if I go back in and look at my hundreds of uh, examples of uh, things in the archive that there might well be something that would open up that avenue. But I would say that's a really brilliant insight and I would love to read an article like that. And I think it's really important to think about that. It's one of the things I'm trying to think about too is you know just all of the different, uh, the, the archive is not just a thing that exists there in time and space devoid of politics pressures and time, as you say. And so I think she thought there was, there was an amplification attempt to saving them and then having a place like the Huntington preserve them. But I'm not sure she foresaw exactly what that would mean. And I think she was worried about public libraries and archives possibly not existing in the future. But I haven't seen her thinking about how uh, uh, an archive like the Huntington is taking up space and time and you know, using different resources and what the kind of trade-offs of that are. I do think that she would 
be very pissed off at some of the things that have happened institutionally. Like you've probably all heard the story about the woman who went in with her kid to the Butler exhibit and, you know, like a guard was chastising her for not watching the kid. And she felt really terrible about, um, and of course she was, it was ridiculous, right? But um, it was, it seemed like another example in some ways to me of like the limits of the institutional archive, which I think we always have to be aware of and always keep pushing back against. But the larger kind of problem of sucking up energy and taking up space is like a harder one to sort of go at, I think. But um, it is interesting to think about the private institution versus the public institution. And I, I briefly allude to this, but she, uh, in another article I talked about how she spent all this time working at the LA Public Library. She thought of it as a second home and an office. She would go there all the time. She would kind of cruise people sometimes, men. She would, you know, look at different, like, you know, magazines that came in. She just spent a ton of time there. And, um, you know, sometimes people ask, why didn't she leave it to them? And uh, I really think she was afraid about the way things were going, that um, institutional archives connected to the public, she was really worried about their fate. Uh, in the wake of, you know, the fire, uh, the downtown um, LA library, and uh, afterwards she was going in with tape and like, you know, putting like pages of books together and things of that nature. She was very emotional about it. So I think she does think about, you know, um, those things uh, and worries about them, but I don't think she's necessarily thinking about sort of the archive taking up energy in the same ways. But I'm really glad thinking about the institution and, and its problems. You know, now there's an Octavia Butler fellowship that they're giving for a year long study. And that doesn't have to be studying Octavia, but things connected, I guess, to Octavia. But people are still rightfully, I think, unhappy that you have to have a PhD to um, apply for it. And also, I'm really hoping that they will give it to writers and, or, you know, scholars of color. Uh, I think it would be unfortunate if, like, you know, it were white people getting it again when we need to have some way to uh, open this up and make the Huntington not just be a site where it's like 99% white people all the time. Thank anyway, you. That's inadequate. That's inadequate. No, it's not at all. Um, and I, I was just going to say, I should have started out by saying that this was such a fantastic talk and generated all kinds of thoughts. And it was really your discussion of the location of the Huntington Library um, near her neighborhood, but not in her neighborhood. Um, and that whole idea of the proximity of social and environmental and geological and, and geographic questions. Um, it seems like it's, it's there. I, yeah, really fascinating. I want to point you to Connie Samaras's work if you don't know it. I talk about her in the forthcoming Feminist Review essay. She's a photographer and she has been um, taking all kinds of photos of bits of the archive in the Huntington Gardens. And it really opens itself up, up, itself up to thinking about Huntington as a collector and the the project of the gardens and also actually the way that the Huntington has historically kind of employed people of color in low wage positions there. And all of those things I think are part of the mix. So your question really makes us have to think about that, which I think is crucial. So thank you. <clears throat> well, and I also think about how separate the, the Huntington is like it, like you, you talked about like, you know, her riding the bus a lot. And, and I was thinking like, that would be a pain to get to the Huntington. Like, no bus anywhere nearby. I yeah, definitely yeah, like there would be a lot of walking involved. For sure. Yeah, so it's just cut off in all these ways, right? And also her mom, I mean, she'll mention it every now and then, you know, uh, it, it does seem like it loomed large as a kind of big elite institution. So I think she was ambivalent about it, but she also, again, saw it as like a mark of, I have reached the status that I have hoped to achieve because they've asked me. Many of you may have seen on social media, she would often write things inside the covers of her Mead notebooks about her plans for the future. They're kind of spells, I think, bringing these things into being. She's hoping, you know, I will be a best-selling writer. I will do this, I will do that. So I think that this, was another sign of, of, of that achievement for her, despite some of the worries and concerns she had about um, archives and institutions. Uh, Shelby, I'm going to let you ask your question. So, Okay, sure. Um, thank you for the talk, Dr. Stravey. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, some of the challenges of the organizing, collectivizing, direct action that Butler and Adrian Marie Brown and others are talking about doing in our current moment. And I know that like, despite how, how prescient uh, Butler is in so many different ways, 2020 has <laughs> broken, I think every possible predictive model imaginable and just its sheer awfulness. Um, 
so thinking about like in our current moment in the middle of a pandemic intersecting with climate crisis, intersecting with racial justice cr crisis, intersecting with political crisis, um, how do we keep kind of moving towards and working towards that sort of mutualism and collect direct, collective direct action when we're sort of separated from each other um, by physical distance and in so many other ways? Um, I don't know, I'm just curious about like what you think um, the sort of the uh, the kind of current thinking or current push is within those movements that you're tapped into. Like, how do we do these things during and Adrian, you know, a pandemic? Adrian has been being on Zoom on overload. I don't know if you've noticed, but um, if you know anything about Adrian Marie Brown, you will see that she's doing many different kinds of events, workshops. A lot of this is moving online. And again, it's not going to be the same, but I think everyone thinks we've got to keep doing these things. Uh, you know, until we can all be physically together again, we have to combine this with other kinds of action. And so, you know, she's been doing um, a bunch of different things. There's a podcast that goes through every chapter of uh, Parable of the Sower, and uh, she and Toshi Reagan times are discussing this with other people, and her sister Autumn also has been a part of this. And she also did some events with us this summer. Um, so she's continuing to try to move a lot of things online. She was saying to me, she feels grateful that if a pandemic like this was going to strike, that it happened when we had tools like the internet and other digital tools that we could still uh, keep trying to make the connections and keep trying to move the, the work forward even in these conditions. But I also you know, think things like direct actions are still going on, you know, like uh, here at the border, uh, the Kumeyaay people have been preventing a portion of the wall, the border wall Trump wants from being constructed. And they stand out there every day and they, they've been, you know, harassed and all kinds of things like that. Uh, but it's been a real struggle. I can think of a lot of other examples like that, that even though we're having to move so many things online, still direct action, you know, continues in different ways. Um, I do think it's important to not just romanticize direct action. That's another thing that Adrienne has been talking about in some of her work. She says she thinks that it's really important that when we go in and are thinking about direct actions together in collaboration with communities, that we don't just do things that are funny or that are just going to make a big splash, but then, you know, it's not going to help that community or later it's going to like hurt them in some way. So I do think we have to be really thoughtful about those kinds of actions and that it can't be like a parachuting in type of thing once we get back to the place where it's more possible for us all to be together again. Um, I do think, you know, again, those kinds of projects are ongoing despite the ways we're all kept physically apart, that some people are still putting their bodies on the line like they always have, uh, you know, uh, disproportionately people of color and indigenous people, of course as we've seen with the protests. I mean, a lot of white people have joined them too, right? But um, I'm, I'm just saying that it really strikes a chord with me and how in all of the work I've been doing for the last five years, it does seem like people of color and indigenous people are putting their bodies on the line in a disproportionate way. So I see it as kind of consonant with that, not like a radically new thing. And I think people are still, you know, trying to do the work in all the ways they can, you know, as long as we can. Oh, Matt. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, first, thank you, Dr. Shruby. Um, this was a really interesting talk, and there are like a myriad of things um, <laughs> that I'm thinking about. Um, but the thing that, for whatever reason, jumped out at me um, that I'm going to try to kind of, you know, keep focused is thinking about the archive. Um, both thinking about like the inaccessibility of the archive that you mentioned, um, both just like structurally and in terms of like you know I think like class and race. Um, the potential that digital archives might have to help offset that or overcome that, but also the implications of like having an archive that is purely digital. Um, if there is something about like a physical tangible archive um, that you think, I guess like that there's a benefit to that, a long-term benefit or a lot of, you know, that there's something about that that's just inherently different from, you know, just kind of like notes collected in a digital cloud somewhere or something. Well, I think there are differences. I'm not going to say that I wouldn't be sad if I could never touch anything in, you know, an archive again physically. I've actually had a lot of sadness over this lately. Luckily, I 
did a ton of the research for my new book before all of this happened. But, you know, I'm still dying to get back to Ottawa for various reasons to do various things. And I'm still having a lot of sadness about not being able to dig through some specific things that I need to dig through in order to feel that I have done justice to Judith Merrill, for instance. Uh, but so I have mixed feelings. I, but I do actually like one of my hopes with the Butler archive was that Ayana and I could try to help digitize a bunch of it. Uh, that's kind of run into some obstacles because I really uh, think the family dealing with Butler's estate, they're wonderful people, but I think there is some concern about just letting things be put up online, you know? Uh, they're worried about that, I think, for various reasons. And so I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say that I don't think it's going to be digitized anytime soon. Um, but I actually, I would be, completely in favor of that. I think that it would be nice to have both exist, you know, and um, I would definitely be using that in my classes. I think it would really lower the bar in all kinds of ways. I hate the PhD bar. Every time one of my students wants to look at this stuff, they have to get a letter from me and somebody else. And I just feel like that's not probably what Octavia would have wanted. And I know Octavia wouldn't have wanted it to be 99% white people looking at her stuff every day, you know? So I'm a big fan of digitization. I do, you know, when I say that I think things are lost, I, I realize it's kind of hard for me to enumerate what those things are. But I think even being able to see like what kind of paper things are on and what how thick things are, what forms they are, how they're clustered together, you know, because when you digitize something often you have to kind of disaggregate the things, you know? That might have been like like all in a cluster or you know one thing on top of another so there are different aspects of the physical archive that i feel it was really important for me to um you know be a part of having getting to handle but at the same time i would always be for digitizing archives i would always argue for that and i would like to have both exist so that you know people could have access but people could also do all the things i do when i get in there and go crazy digging around as well <clears throat> Well, and it's kind of speaking of the archive and digging around in it, um, like I feel like you probably got a really uh, interesting kind of viewpoint of Butler's process. I mean, uh, you know, you, you can kind of sh see the sheer amount of research she did, the kinds of research she did, what was drawing her eye, you know, the, her writing process kind of becomes more clear, I think, when you have those materials in front of you. But I was, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you've been able to talk with your students at UCSD or even the attendees of the Clarion Writers Workshop about the, the kinds of things you found in her process. Um, so not so much the content, but like the actual like work that she did and the things she was doing. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a great question. I definitely do that with my graduate students and undergrads, but you, I like it that you asked about the Clarion workshop. So, uh, you know, as, as you said at the beginning, I've been directing it since 2010 and it's really changed my life. And one of the things I really love is that, um, you know, I've become a person who encourages uh, all of the Clarion writers to go see the Clarion archive at UCSD, which also has a bunch of Octavia stuff in it. And so they're able to kind of see what kind of stories did she write when she was a student like I am, and what were the materials that were connected to her particular Clarion cohort. And they make a pilgrimage every year. And Octavia, I would have to say, is number one, even though we've got a bunch of great people in there. So as they are learning how to be writers, that it, figuring out that process for her is really important to them. But for me, yeah, I mean, for both talking with Clarion Workshop people and talking to my students, yeah, apart from the archive, kind of the way she puts things together, I think is really illuminating. Not only the millions of drafts she would produce for everything she ever wrote, that's one of the most interesting parts to me. There's a kind of dream work aspect to a lot of the drafts. That's a word I use in some of my published work, um, you know, where she just explores different possibilities for the book that don't end up being in the book and sometimes ends up just, you know, imagining completely different things. So I've tried to make in my graduate teaching, especially these ideas around archiving and memory work and how one uh, does this world building partly through research and not just, you know, making shit up is, you know, really crucial. And it's interestingly fed projects by a, di a variety of kinds of students, some of them science fiction writers, um, you know, some people working, say, in critical refugee studies, the field uh, founded by my colleague, Yana Spiritu, and are really having problems with ways of talking about refugees that are, again, kind of parachuting in and seeing them as victims and then 
uh, often speculative fiction becomes a way that both refugees and you know folks working with refugees can kind of tell the stories in a different way that uh, imagines a future and just doesn't position people as victims. So I see Arcavia, Ar Arcavia as doing that herself. And so it is partly about, yes, feeding the writing. Nothing was more important to her than the writing, but it's also a way of thinking and a way of being in the world and a way to address different kinds of problems, I think, that you know allow us, again, to imagine a future and not just see people as victims uh, of a harsh past and present. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Was there some oh. other part? Of <laughs> um, well, I, you know, we're just right at time, but I, I wanted to thank you very much. This was wonderful. And it makes, it's, it's, it's sad that like, like I think mostly those of us in this, you know, this little zoom room could go to the Huntington, but most people couldn't, but it makes me want to go and like look through things. Um, just to kind of get an insight. I loved her code, color coding like that. I, I'm going to geek out over her color coding for a while. There's um, a ton of that kind of thing. So, you know, you're going to find a lot of it when yeah. you find it. <laughs> but thank you. This is fascinating. I've written so many things down that I want to go check out now. Um, thank you for asking me. And I really appreciate your patience through this whole, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, we finally got here. That's all that matters. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Thanks to every one of you um, for organizing it. Thanks to every one of you for being here. Yeah. yeah, and I yeah, I wanted to especially thank um, Shelby and Matt for putting this all together and moving it online and making sure that we all got here today. <laughs> okay, have a good one. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Bye.